In 2008, an Orthodox activist, Tamara Kvitkovska, filed a complaint with a prosecutor's office against the 1999 South Park episode Mr. Henke's Christmas Classics, which at the time aired on a twice two channel. According to Kvitkovska, quote, a son seen in piece of feces in a Santa Claus had robbed her of her sleep as well as her health and sanity. During the investigation, experts with PhDs in psychology, pedagogy, and law were involved, and their verdict was as follows. All of the above expressions, comparisons, and allusions used in the cartoon are clearly and grossly degrading to human dignity and offensive to the religious feelings of Christian believers. They cannot be ignored or tolerated. They cause them extremely severe, unbearable moral and psychological suffering and humiliate their honor and dignity. According to experts in this South Park episode, it is claimed that the holiday of Christmas was actually given to people by a piece of excrement and not by God at all, which is the strongest insult and cruel humiliation of the dignity of believing Christians. The accusations were not supported by general public at the time. Apparently, even other Orthodox activists were not eager to support Kvitkovska, especially since she was offended by the episode that mentioned Catholic Christmas and not the Orthodox one. So the case was mostly ridiculed. It is also worth mentioning that at the time, the Russian criminal code did not include a special protection of religious feelings. Therefore, the statement included a request to initiate a criminal case under Article 282 of the Criminal Code of the Russian Federation, which punishes extremism. Like, imagine framing Mr. Hanke as an extremist. <laughs> he did nothing wrong, he just wanted to cheer everyone up at Christmas. The case is even more ridiculous if we take into account the actual content of the episode. Since the episode was exactly about how everyone is offended by everything, so the Christmas play at school has to get rid of anything that might potentially offend the audience. And they end up with the minimalist contemporary play that no one likes. While Kyle suggests his imaginary friend Mr. Hanke to revive the spirit of Christmas, the episode ends with everyone singing and dancing in a circle, a happy ending, even Kenny did not die in this episode. South Park episodes have often offended the sensibilities of audiences around the world. So this case is not unique. As a satirical show, offending and mocking are central to South Park. Leonard Friedman says in his book Offensive Art that there will always be a tension between satire and the public, because for satire, taboos of all kinds will inevitably be the subject of ridicule, no matter how sacred they are to people. This South Park episode is not a high-profile thing, nor is it the most egregious example of public censorship in Russia or anywhere else in the world. But I love the South Park case, because it reflects a certain kind of reaction to art or media entertainment in general. It's a kind of engagement with art that is done in bad faith, often when the offended person hasn't even seen or read or played the thing that they are offended by. And it is when someone is offended or displeased with art, but on behalf of a group, or sometimes even a group that they are not part of. For example, in the 1990s, the English professor at Pennsylvania State University took offense at Goya's The Naked Maha, a reproduction of which hung in her classroom, claiming that female students felt uncomfortable working with the reproduction on the wall, that having the portrait on the wall was anti-feminist and a form of sexual harassment. It was clear that the teacher was uncomfortable with the reproduction, but she was also speaking on behalf of female students, who at least publicly did not share the same sentiment. In 2015, a group of protesters were offended by a Kimono Wednesday event at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where museum goers could try on a kimono that was a replica of the one Monet's wife wears in his famous portrait of her. 
Visitors could take photos and share them on social media. Although the kimono was issued by the Japanese broadcasting company and the same event had taken place in Japan a year earlier, where no one was offended, protesters at the MFA in Boston accused the museum of Orientalism, Imperialism and the disrespectful exoticization of Japanese culture. Soon the protest was met with a counter-protest where Japanese Americans in kimonos came out and said they were not offended by the event at all. I wonder what's up with being offended on behalf of Japanese people. It really seems to be in vogue these days. I could not help but think of the recent reaction to the new Assassin's Creed video game, particularly to a historical figure named Yasuke as one of the main characters. The game hasn't been released yet, but people already have strong opinions about it, that it is offensive to set a video game in Japan and have a non-Japanese main character. Wait, now I... Okay, never mind. In 2017, Dana Schutz painting Open Casket, which depicts the mutilated body of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old African-American boy who was the victim of a hate crime, caused a public outcry and protest. An open letter was sent to the creators of the exhibition asking that the painting be destroyed because, quote, it is not acceptable for a white person to transmute black suffering into profit and fun. There are many difficulties associated with the study of offensive art. The first is the emotional nature of being offended. To offend is to humiliate, scold, to dishonor. But in legal practice, for example, the definition of insult or offense includes not only violated honor and dignity, but also various feelings. Are there ways to distinguish feelings? And which feelings should be protected? and which should not. How can feelings be verified? This is why in public conflicts around art, the claim that someone's feelings have been hurt often arouses suspicion. Now, let me be clear. I believe that people can be genuinely hurt by art. The process of engaging with art or any other form of creativity is an intimate and personal experience, because even when we watch a movie in a group or listen to a concert, we're still in a sense alone, trapped in our subjectivity. During these intimate engagements with art, assuming one does so in good faith, a person can be heard as an individual, as well as inspired or scared or swept away by all sorts of emotions. People can also express dissatisfaction with art, because art is not immune to criticism. We're all different, which is great by the way, and where there are differences, there is conflict. And conflict is not inherently pathological. For instance, there is Jacques Rancière's concept called the census. Rancière describes the census as a conflict, but a conflict that is not between someone who says white and someone who says black. Instead, it is a conflict between those who both say white, but do not realize that they are talking about the same thing. The census can only occur to those who are already on the way to agreement and who are acting within the same law or norm. Active participation in the dissensus allows people to gain visibility, which is the case in many conflicts around art, where people fight for the legitimacy of their influence on cultural sphere. In Ranciere's dissensus, participants have actual stakes. People can gain certain benefits and rights. But in the cases I focus on, it is unclear how the quality of life of the participants is improved. In the vast majority of cases, the problem is not one of communication. It is the nature of the conflict itself that is distorted. Whereas in Ranciere's case, the possibility of speaking out about being wronged ultimately frees one from effect and gives satisfaction. In our cases, the participants become hostages to effect and resentment. So what I have a problem with is this petty, inconsistent, theatrical and often over-the-top reaction to art. When someone doesn't even try to engage with something that they are offended by. And these situations can be ultimately described by one Russian idiom. I have not read Pasternak, but I condemn him.
Protests against art as we know them today are a relatively new phenomenon. Although there is a long history of art that has challenged values and beliefs, shocked, disturbed and offended people, one can recall Plato's idea of the dangers of the poets in the Republic or Michelangelo's depiction of some figures in The Last Judgment that were painted over after his death because obscenity. But the conflict itself tended to emerge within the art sphere, that is, within the small circle of art producers and art consumers. For example, a group of artists could create a new movement and be ostracized by their more conservative peers, but they were all still within the same what Pierre Bourdieu called cultural field. They were people who had the same educational background, they went to the same salons, theaters, read the same books. So even when some members of the public found works offensive, they rarely expressed their dissatisfaction in the form of effective protest or calls for censorship. On the contrary, we see how in 1960, a month after the obscenity trial over Lady Chatterley's Lover by D. H. Lawrence, all 200,000 copies were sold on the first day. People were craving provocative art. But since the end of the 20th century, public conflicts around controversial art have changed. First, the range of themes, motives and objects that the public finds offensive is expanding and growing. Second, the manifestations of protest are becoming more aggressive, accompanied by violence in various forms. Third, even works that are recognized as classics can now cause outrage in the context of criticism of various social problems. And finally, with the development of mass communication and the internet, the nature of the encounter with the work of art has changed. Because now you don't have to attend a cultural event. You can just watch recordings of it on social media. The internet connects people from all over the world who would otherwise be separated not only geographically, but also culturally and in their ways of thinking. As separate studies of art conflicts by Stephen Tepper and Stephen Dubin show, in contemporary realities the groups that are offended by art vary in their political, religious and ethnic affiliations. So on the one hand we have right-wing groups, religious fundamentalists, nationalists who oppose art because it depicts something that is perceived as blasphemous or corrupt into morality. On the other hand, we have marginalized groups who try to push back art that is perceived as affirming stigmas or that has, quote, residual signs of racism, sexism and homophobia and want to replace it with more acceptable images of themselves. According to Stephen Dubin, both sides are delusional in their efforts. As the first tries to, quote, erase significant social progress by destroying cultural traces of it, and the second believes that by eliminating symbols of oppression, they will somehow eliminate oppression itself. This artwork is offensive to minorities, that artwork has too many minorities and pushes woke agenda, this is offensive to religious feelings, and that one is corrupting youths. It seems that we live in a culture of ambivalent aggression. One way to look at this problem is through the notions of boredom and helplessness. There are too many things to be dissatisfied with that affect people's real lives. And the sphere of culture is where one can express dissatisfaction mostly without serious consequences. I think this also explains why so many people often complain about artists, directors or video game developers not catering specifically to their desires. Because it seems to be the only place where your opinion really matters. We live in a moment of overabundance of entertainment, so it would appear that if you are not satisfied with some media, you can just read another book watch another show or play another video game. But there is still this expectation that media would serve us specifically. And I don't completely blame the public here. Because the media industry has flirted with audiences in the form of fan service over the last few decades and has generally mastered the mechanisms of targeting specific audiences. 
but the art world still operates within its own laws and does not really consult with the public. In his book Park of Culture, Culture and Violence in Moscow Today, Mikhail Yampolsky mentions this irritation felt by some members of the public, as if artists or galleries or directors do what they want without asking the public. The idea that the art world is laughing at the public behind closed doors. But once the institutions start to pander to the public, it becomes a dead end. For example, in the 2000s, there was an exhibition in Moscow called Beware Religion that was attacked by Orthodox activists. After the attack, many members of the art community felt that the organizers of the exhibitions were to blame. They had used such an explosive topic as religion without consulting the public. At a conference in Yekaterinburg in 2004, an artist and curator, Marina Kaldobska, recounted her own experience of organizing an exhibition that was not controversial, ostensibly because preliminary consultations had been held with representatives of the Russian Orthodox Church. And guess what? A year later, Kaldobskaya's own work was attacked by Orthodox activists, who accused her of blasphemy and insulting the feelings of Orthodox believers. If someone wants to find something to be offended by, they will always find it. Mikhail Yampolsky compares such persecution of cultural figures on the principle of random sampling to an epidemic or Russian roulette because it is hard to predict what will cause a rage and what would not. In his book Hate Spin, Cherry and George points out that the reason public outcry seems so random in many cases is that opportunities for offense are often deliberately used to achieve political goals. Deliberate offense is disguised as victimhood, when there is a need to identify, unify and separate one group from another. In other words, offense taken can be instrumentalized. And so offense happens not because this particular exhibition or book is the most outrageous thing ever, but because at some point it was useful for a leader, a political pundit or an activist group to point out enemies and allies. The hypocrisy of taking offense also lies in the contradiction of drawing attention to something that you supposedly do not want anyone to see. This is also known as the Streisand effect. Activists publicize the offensive material, but at the same time they demand its censorship. This makes no sense if you are truly motivated by a desire to protect your community from seeing this content. Steven Tepper's comprehensive study of cultural conflicts in the United States also found that the number of conflicts over art increases during election cycles and coincides with periods of drastic social change and economic crisis. So it's not the art that makes people angry, but the instability, the economic problems, the powerlessness. In this sense, the art sphere can become a platform for people to express their dissatisfaction. The outrage is misplaced, but the grievance itself is real. On this account, protests against controversial art are often misdiagnosed. They are not as natural and sincere as they first appear. In most cases, the offense is the result of a collective effort and not the product of individual tastes and preferences. So the study of offensive art is quite problematic. Once we start siding absolutely with the art field and completely ignore public outrage as a misinformed reaction of a media illiterate audience, we run the risk of falling into the snobbish illusion that art and any form of creativity does not invite discussion, or that the audience must react within a certain expected framework, mediated by the artist or a gallery or whatever. I think it is wrong. The art field is not spared from criticism or even protest reactions. At the same time, to subject the art world to the expectations of people who clearly interact with it in bad faith is not the route I would like everyone to go. Someone is always going to be offended. In his study of offensive images, William Mitchell even proposed the idea of an exhibition where anyone could vandalize and destroy works of art they found offensive, because he also links protest against art to iconoclasm and fetishism, and tries to demystify the power of images. 
In a way, being offended by an image is a form of enslavement. But by allowing the conflict to fully unravel, we can potentially understand that there was nothing to be outraged about in the first place. I like this idea. But I have another one. How about we stop indulging in the resentful and whiny attitude toward art that leads to destruction altogether? Let's go back to Mr. Hanke and what this episode has taught us. Well, that once you start pandering to everyone and getting rid of anything that might stir up outrage, you end up with the most boring and joyless art and people will still get mad. So I think we just have to allow ourselves to enjoy the art, enjoy the media and not expect something from art that it cannot give. If there is something that irritates or disturbs us, we can always just turn it off. Thank <laughs> you.